spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Chaminade University. Well, good morning. Thanks so much for tuning in here on this Monday morning. Great to see all of you starting the week here uh, with us on Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise. And Yanji, today we go back to the state capitol to speak with somebody who always gets a lot of questions from our viewers. That's right. He's an emergency room doctor. He's the lieutenant governor, and he's also in charge of the vaccine rollout and the safe travels program. So a lot of expertise this morning. We're, of course, talking about Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. Good morning. Good morning. Well, great to have you here. Um, we're looking better on the numbers front. Let's break down what we're seeing today. Uh, just over 400 new cases reported. Yes, uh, thank you, Genji. 431 cases. Monday counts are a little lower normally, but the positivity rate is dropping. We're at 5.75% positivity. That compares very favorably to the mainland, which is at 8.67% positivity. We've consistently been below that. We've also seen a precipitous drop in our hospitalizations. That's very important. As of today, we have 308 individuals in the hospital, 38, in, 38 of those individuals are vaccinated, that's 12%. But that was the crisis that we were facing. On September 3rd, I think we might have even been together that day, we reached 448 people in the hospital. That was really pressing the limits of what we could do safely in our healthcare system. It also ended, us, ended up making us broach certain other questions, like whether or not we would ever have to invoke uh, these crisis standards of care, which I object to. So, so many challenges were coming. We were pressed hard, but people took it uh, un, you know, onto themselves. We did not gather for two weeks. We were careful over Labor Day, which I'm so appreciative of to everybody. A lot more people are getting vaccinated. And so we've seen our numbers drop. They're not low. Who would have ever thought we'd be happy about 400 people uh, positive, but they're a lot lower, which means we have less pressure on our hospital system and we're able to deliver care better. One of the things that we always look at uh, when we look at these numbers are just any potential surges, any areas uh, where we know that this is uh, the virus is spreading more. Uh, are we seeing any trends, anything that you've noticed from clusters or any reports of certain areas within the state that are uh, areas to watch? Yes, we have had some clusters in the last couple of weeks. We did have another prison cluster, which we know uh, really is difficult to stop because very few of the individuals in prison who are incarcerated have been willing to get vaccinated. That's a great challenge and we have to help them as much as we can. And we have to help our guards. We have to help everyone in that circumstance. The other cycles that we've seen with the virus have been, for instance, surges in a couple of different schools. We had one uh, outbreak on a, on a Kauai campus where a whole classroom lit up, I believe and on a Maui campus. Now, a lot of those cases also were coming from home and contact with family members. So these are some of the clusters that we do see. It is a great challenge to keep the Delta variant from spreading because it's so infectious. It spreads on average to six to eight people as opposed to the original variant of, of COVID. But we've seen that happen, but on the whole, it has been declining. We still see a lot of cases on the west side of the island where we're still trying to play catch up with vaccinations, but people are doing better. And I guess we could run the hospital, uh, not just the hospital numbers, but the vaccination numbers. I mean, statewide, it's it's gonna be good news mostly. We have now reached some of our goals. We are at 66.5% of the entire state being vaccinated. That's eighth best in the country. We are at 75% of the entire state having initiated vaccination, 75% of everybody, including kids who can't get vaccinated yet. And we're at 88.8% .8 of all of those who are eligible in the state have been vaccinated, at least with their first shot. That means that it will be a lot more rare where we'll, where we'll see outbreaks. We still have some challenges ahead of us. We have our keiki, ages five to 11, which will eventually get approved, which I'll you know talk to you about if you'd like to. And we have 119,000 of those children, age five to 11, of whom Sammy is one of them. So I can't wait for my son, Sam, uh, if he chooses with, with Jamie and me and his pediatrician to get vaccinated, can't wait for that to happen. So. Lots of things in the work, but that means the cases will continue to t trend down. And then in the aftermath of the large case counts, we right now have 
7,431 active cases. In the aftermath of that, we'll see fewer hospitalizations and then, of course, fewer fatalities. Let's talk about the hospitalizations. You made news over the weekend. Uh, there was some. There's an article in the paper saying that you were actually communicating with the Surgeon General, asking for more uh, assistance for our state and for others to avoid having to ration care. Do you think that since the numbers are going down, that we will not have to face that question? Um, and if we did have to face that question, it seems that you are at odds with the governor about those crisis of care standards. Uh, yes, there's a lot to unpack there. So, first of all. Uh, most importantly for our people, I do not think we'll ever have to do that. I think that we are sufficiently out of the red zone. We are down, hospitalization-wise, down 31% from our peak. So like I said, our peak was 448 on September 3rd, and today it's at 308. And we will tend to get discharges in the next 48 hours. That's what usually happens on Mondays and Tuesdays. So we're kind of out of the most dangerous zone. But even at a higher number, I object to any uh, crisis standard of care, which is also called rationing of care. And the reason I object to that is because in the state of Hawaii and the country, when you have 18 months to build up your response, to put other facilities online, to bring in extra healthcare providers like we did successfully through the work of Department of Health and the Healthcare Association of Hawaii and Hilton Rathel's excellent work, we brought 650 nurses and uh, respiratory therapists in to help us. We are going to keep some of those in a rolling fashion and we're gonna make sure that we care for everybody. But I know it really terrified people. I got calls from all over the country actually, but in our state, I got calls from people 72, 75, 86, telling me, are we really considering rationing care if they end up sick? And the answer has to be no, we have to find a way. We can surge our intensive care unit capacity at least 20% of all of our facilities. We've been doing that for months on end, but we can actually do a lot more. We can use monoclonal antibodies, which you know are very valuable uh, to keep people out of the hospital. So I, when I wrote to the Surgeon General, who is a friend, I, I told uh, Dr. Murthy that we had a success here in Hawaii to do that. We stared down our peak and we were able to not use, not use any rationing of care. Whereas in Idaho, for example, because they have not vaccinated their people, they went up to 25% positivity. So everyone's catching COVID there and then they're gonna be in the hospital and they will see fatalities. So I think there have to be extra nurses sent to Idaho and Texas and wherever there's a surge. Will it be difficult? Absolutely, it's difficult to find staff. Is it worth it? Without a doubt. We have CARES Act money, every state does. We have access to communication with all of these different states. And when it's uh, safe in one region, that's a good time to bring healthcare personnel to another if you want to avoid this. And so that's what I shared with the Surgeon General. It's also what I shared with all of our team. I think that the way that was rolled out was unfortunate because we had finally moved away from our peak, but there, there is no mountain we shouldn't move. We should move heaven and earth to prevent ever rationing care, especially from our seniors. And so that's the point I was trying to make. With we, When you look across the country, there are many other states that are also surging and could be in that same vulnerable position that the state of Hawaii was just a few weeks ago with those rising numbers in the hospitals. Uh, in the hospitals. Would there be enough nurses to go around throughout the country servicing all of these uh, areas, as you mentioned, and say, if we end up back in a position like that, having to compete to try to get these nurses back in, uh, I just imagine that with Delta surging throughout the country, it would be a little difficult to send these nurses to every state essentially, or even half the states uh, should it get to that point. Well, you make a very good point, Ryan. So when we were at first pursuing this large cohort of nurses, we were in competition with Texas and Oregon, and that actually drove up the cost. But FEMA did pick up the cost of this initiative and it saved many lives, I can tell you that. It's also supported our staff when they've gotten sick and we've had otherwise large pieces of our healthcare community at home because they had to either go into isolation or quarantine or even be treated for COVID. Uh, yes, it would be a challenge, but that's what uh, the complex nature of this virus requires. It would also be something that we would be proud of as a nation. A lot of people have seen divisive uh, arguments about vaccination, about mandates, about care delivered uh, to different groups of people. Like I said earlier, Idaho is now rationing care. You could see how it would really unite us as a country if nurses were coming in from Montana, which has very low numbers, very, very rural, and were able to go help out in neighboring Idaho. You could see how when Hawaii, say four or six months from now, is virtually all vaccinated and we have very few cases, you might very well be able to offer some support when we don't have a surge of COVID. 
And obviously in New York, where they had a terrible go early on, and they were asking people to send ventilators there, they've since seen a big decline in their COVID rates, and we might be able to help them. So there's lots of different things that we could do as a country, and that's really why you have the centralized federal government uh, as your partner in this battle. But it's never easy. I've even recommended that we bring in some visiting nurses from foreign nations that don't have COVID. As long as they're fully licensed, then we can trust that they will deliver top-notch care to our people. We've long done that. Uh, we often do hire lots of nurses from the Philippines and other countries uh, in Asia. So this is a unique time. I think it's got to be all hands on deck. And it has been for us in Hawaii. So we're thankful to the federal government for what they've done. And that really is what spawned the idea for us to, number one, not ration care anywhere in our country and to do it in a partnership with all of our other states. We know that the vast majority of people who are hospitalized with COVID and need advanced care are unvaccinated. Jean has a question here. It says, what is the ration of care in regards to vax versus unvaxed individuals? Um, I asked this also because there was an editorial in the paper just this weekend from a resident who wrote in who said, I'm elderly, I got vaccinated, but I'm over 65. So in that current model, I would be lower on the list than someone who's younger and chose not to get vaccinated. What is your thought on this whole vaccinated versus unvaccinated when it comes to priorities of care? Well, that was one of the many reasons that I felt that we under no circumstance could ration care because I could never envision taking a ventilator away from a 75 year old or an 82 year old person who had been vaccinated to give it to someone who was less responsible. But as a physician, I will tell you this, I would not feel comfortable ever rationing care to that 42 or 43 year old or 28 year old either, who unfortunately got that information, didn't get vaccinated and caught COVID. We should not ration care away from anyone. We have a lot of surplus capacity in our state. We have 78 individuals on uh, in the ICU right now and 56 people on ventilators with COVID. That's just a small fraction of what we have available to us now. Now it got scary when we were at 448 on September 3rd, but I couldn't stomach rationing care ever. These are the questions that really divide society. Can you imagine if we started telling people one way or another that they could not receive care because of their vaccination status, because of their age, because of their race? These are impossibilities for us. And I think it really would damage the fabric of our, our values in Hawaii and in our country. Um, it would create a moral problem for physicians and nurses all across the state. You just can't go there. It's different if there is a plane crash or a terrorist attack where you in the moment have to make decisions about triage. And as an emergency room physician, I've many times had to triage patients when many people have come in with a car accident where we have to quickly go to the first patient then the second then the third based on how, how ill they are, how hurt they are. But that's not what you have to do when you can plan months ahead for capacity at a, at a hospital or monoclonal antibodies or oxygen or a nurse. So I didn't want us to go there because it's already pretty contentious. I think you guys are all aware that it's so sensitive an issue that people are protesting both for uh, vaccinations and against. There are people who are so strongly opposed to vaccinations or mandates that they are rallying in the streets of Waikiki. And I want us to come together because at the end of the day, you know that we can spread COVID between ourselves, whether we're um, vaccinated yet or not. We have our kids, we all have kids. And it's been pretty disconcerting to see people have so much hate for one another when really we normally love each other in Hawaii. A few weeks back, we saw a number of implementations and restrictions that were placed back, uh, especially here in the city and county of Honolulu since then, of course, Safer Access Oahu was launched, and there have been me uh, measures taken to help to bring those numbers down. Uh, now, the mayor said that this would go on for a few weeks, for 21 days. We're getting to a point where that timeline that he set forth, where we kind of put a pause on things and pulled back on some of the uh, early restrictions that were lifted that were re-implemented, uh, we're coming up on that deadline here. Do you think that the restrictions that are currently in place needs to be extended for a few more weeks, uh, another month. How much longer do you think that we need to continue on uh, under the current recommendations and restrictions that are placed uh, with residents and visitors in, in Hawaii? That's a very good question. So this is obviously a question that the mayor has to wrestle with and with the governor. But I would say this, we've had a good four weeks, but we're not completely out of the woods yet. 308 people in the hospital is no joy. Uh, 308 would have still been the peak of the previous two surges. So we were talking about that this morning. We never got uh, much over 308. I think it was 328 was the absolute peak we had for one day in the previous surge. So this was as bad as it got uh, in the first two surges. 
So I don't think we're in a great spot. We're just in a much better spot than we were on September 3rd. I think it would merit four more weeks without a doubt to keep things kind of calming down. The case counts are dropping now. And I think that it's good to see the benefit of the vaccination movement uh, kind of locked in. Also, I would like to see some other changes though. Uh, life does have to go on. We want to make sure we salvage the fall uh, for the purposes of travel, for the holidays, you know, right around the corner is Thanksgiving and then Christmas and New Year's. We don't want to see a big surge then, which is more costly than losing part of September, or early October. But we can be sensible. For instance, we should really get back to letting some of the normalcy return for parents going to see their kids play high school sports. If they're vaccinated or tested, there's no reason they shouldn't be able to see their kids. They should be smart and safe, but they should be able to see their kids play. Same thing for UH football. States all across the country are looking at that and they're letting gigantic crowds, sometimes unvaccinated, be together to watch major football uh, games. I think in our state, it's certainly safe if we are vaccinated that we can send our fans back to watch UH football. These are the kind of things which you gradually get back to normal. Uh, restaurants, the gathering sizes are not too, uh, not too, I guess, difficult to deal with. The outdoor gathering has been kind of kept under wraps a little bit, which is good because there was spread from some outdoor gatherings. We, st we still need to be safe. Uh, and I don't think four weeks or two weeks is going to hurt. But that's a question for the mayor. I think that Mayor Blangiardi did a pretty good job uh, kind of striking a balance between what we could do to keep our society and our economy going with what we could tolerate as individuals. I want to press you a little bit more on the UH question because it is something that, you know, a debate that's happening in our community. Some people writing in the comments that nobody should care about sports right now, but for a lot of folks, uh, UH football is very important, especially to the families. Where are you on that right now? Should there be a waiting period and then going back, like you were saying, maybe four more weeks? Or are you saying that those fans should be allowed in now? And what should that actually look like? Well, I definitely think fully vaccinated family family members should be able to go to games I, and see their you know their sons or, or daughters play sports. I think that that is a fully safe environment for them to do it. And even a larger crowd, as long as people are fully vaccinated or tested within three days, that again is fine. I know that they have a two day limit on the testing for their um, their safe program or their safe events program, but it was really three days, which I felt was a kind of a normal standard. Yeah, sports are secondary as far as the overall function of society, but they are also the beginning of returning to normal. And I think we can begin to return to normal because we've got, for now, the virus under control. Also, when you have such a large percentage of your population vaccinated, you're just not going to see a lot of community spread. And that's, you know, that's the truth. I mean, you got to follow the science. For me as a doctor, I always like to see cases come down because I know how much pressure was placed on Queens Hospital, Straub, Capulani, everywhere, everywhere they were completely burdened. Uh, on the other hand, losing year after year of these activities, these are losses that you can never recover. Uh, we did keep schools open. That was, of course, more important overall than having big gatherings, than having clubs going, than having um, concerts or football games, though I love all those things. Having school back in, in person was critical for the development of our children. So these were some of the compromises and sacrifices that had to be made. Uh, but now we're moving away from that. Now kids are safer. Soon they will be vaccinated, which will make them very safe. And I think that most of the country is already there. So I don't think we're such geniuses here that we know that we have a different code altogether. We've done some things well. We have the lowest mortality rate in the country tied with uh, Vermont which is pretty extraordinary. Uh, but we, you know, we also have to start restoring normalcy and that means traveling, reuniting families. You saw that the federal government is gonna allow international travel back again uh, come November from pretty much everywhere because they know families have to be reunited, reunited too. So it's all a process. And interestingly, football is part of that process. Earlier, you mentioned uh, returning to normalcy also with tourism and uh, actually on this program about a month ago, the governor made that announcement and statement saying to tourists that uh, do not come to Hawaii, that Hawaii is not a place, safe place to travel right now. Uh, I talked to some in the hospi uh, hospitality industry who's saying that they've seen the effects of that statement by the governor, that cancellations have gone up, that people are, were heeding the governor's advice not to travel to the islands during this time. And they're seeing uh, a really a sharp decline in those arrivals. Given where we're at right now, do you think that it is safe for visitors to return to Hawaii? Uh, 
safe with the caveat that they should all be vaccinated. There really needs to be vaccination. Also, it has been a welcome pause. Uh, I don't like to ever see any uh, people lose their jobs if they're working in hospitality, and that's been a great concern. It's why I built the Safe Travels program with my team back last October to, to bring us kind of out of uh, financial ruin. Uh, but it has been a welcome pause to be down 35 or 40% from a health standpoint. From a healthcare standpoint, that made a big difference in these last few weeks, and that will resonate for another few weeks. I do think the governor has to signal what he feels comfortable with going into October, November. It usually takes at least three weeks for people to reboot uh, the travel economy. That means that he's going to need to say something this week or next so that we know that we can recover toward the end of October. Do keep in mind, and I know people um, always question this when I say it, but I want to be very consistent. The number of cases that came from travel were between 1.5 and 2% of all of our cases. The number of cases that came from our own friends and family returning if they were not vaccinated was closer to 10 to 12%. And then the rest was community spread. So we can have travel here safely, but we should be really diligent. We could add some extra testing, which would probably be very sensible. But we as a society, now that we're so well vaccinated, it will be much safer. And we've seen almost no tourists hospitalized here in Hawaii for COVID, that is. So it is a, th a safe thing for us to do. But if the governor gives us a signal sometime in the next couple of weeks, we will have adequate travel safely in November. We'll have normal holiday seasons, which are very important for people's, uh, you know, paying for people's kids, for their school, for their Christmas, for New Year's, all these things. So I hope he'll speak up in the next couple of weeks. We talked about that this morning. I want to ask you, uh, Mayor Mitch Roth was on this program recently, and one of his suggestions, because he said he can't uh, really follow up with everyone who chooses to quarantine when they return home, this is uh, even the travelers. So this is travelers who are unvaccinated or returning residents who are unvaccinated have the option to declare that they will be in quarantine. But of course, uh, the islands is particularly one as large as his doesn't have the resources to do checks uh, on the level that they would need uh, to make sure that these people are abiding. One thing that he said that he uh, wants and that the governor said the attorney general is looking into is actually publishing the names of the people who take this option, uh, perhaps online, perhaps in the newspaper. What are your thoughts on on that. Well, look, I, I love Mayor Roth. He is a personal friend. I really like that guy. It sounds a little harsh. I mean, I'm not going to lie, it, but it's good to make people accountable. At this point, a lot of people returning were not adhering to their quarantine. And it sounds like something a, a thoughtful and somewhat stern prosecutor would do. And that's what Mayor Roth was. He was a very good prosecutor and he's a very good mayor. It does seem a little bit harsh because we're trying in general to bring down the heat and unite people. If everyone would just do their quarantine or get vaccinated one or the other, I guess this question would never be raised. I'm not going to second guess him. It's not personally something that I would do only because, you know, it's that's pretty uh, that's that's bringing out the hammer real hard. Uh, on the flip side, I don't want any innocent people catching COVID from those who have chosen not to be vaccinated or not quarantined. So it's his call. I will support him in general uh, because I know all of the mayors have really wrestled with what's going on. Also, I would comment, if I'm not mistaken, that the positivity rate on the Big Island is higher. It's been a percentage point higher on Big Island than it is on Oahu. And they also had 29 people this morning, if I remember correctly, in the hospital in Hilo. That's pretty much capacity for COVID. So when he's taking very strong stands like that, he's doing it to keep people alive and safe. And, and I commend him for that. I want to switch gears just for a little bit as we wrap things up here in our final moments. Uh, on Friday, we had former First Lady Vicky Cayetano here on this program talking about her candidacy for governor. Uh, we know that, of course, you will be seeking that office as well. Wanted to get your thoughts about her entering the race officially and uh, your thoughts about the upcoming campaign with uh, Vicky Cayetano now uh, in the running, also seeking this office. You bet. Uh, well, let me say this. Uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Cayetano is a terrific person. I don't know her well, uh, but I've heard good things about her across the board. So uh, I wish her well in every way. Uh, as to me, there are so many people suffering right now in Hawaii. There are so many people sick. I'm really just focusing on people in the intensive care unit and dealing with this COVID crisis. In time, I'm sure we'll be able to have lots of discussions about uh, politics, but I'm just trying to look out for people right now.
<laughs> very political and diplomatic answer this morning. Uh, I want to ask you, um, and I expect diplomacy in this answer as well, The uh, one of the co-founders of the Aloha Freedom Coalition, which is a, um, I, I don't know if you would call them an anti-vax association or a uh, pro-choice association, I don't know how they define themselves, but folks who are against the vaccine, some, some of these people who have actually protested outside of your residence and been very public about that, uh, that individual caught COVID and has now distanced himself from that group. What can you tell us about your reaction to that? Well, my first reaction was I felt terrible for that guy because I saw pictures of him uh, on oxygen and the physician in me knows that he's, you know, very sick, he's hurting. And so I did feel badly because I, I knew that that was going to happen. I knew that a lot of people who were protesting in large gatherings without social distancing, and obviously they were not vaccinated, uh, I think was their whole point, uh, were going to get sick. And my colleagues and I would care for them in the hospital, which we're honored to do. As to that group, of course, I'm very frustrated with them because they scared a lot of people. They scared a lot of innocent people. As of now, I think I said there's 148,000 people who have not yet gotten vaccinated that are eligible. And it's my understanding that many of those individuals are watching those protests and having second thoughts about taking the necessary step to get safe through vaccination. So I was really appreciative of the fact that once he had a real experience with COVID, the experiences I've been witnessing and I had when I caught COVID, that he realized the best thing to do is to uh, think of this as a health issue, not as a political issue, not as not as a protest issue or something to divide Hawaii. So I wish him well. I want him to get better. I want his wife to get better. And I want all of the people in all of these organizations to look at this through the lens of healthcare because children can catch COVID. Our kupuna are starting to begin to lose their immunity, although they're going to get the booster shot obviously soon. This is really what America has to be about and Hawaii has to be about. You don't have to worry about me being protested. If I'm going to be a little bit of a lightning rod and it results in what happened today here with you on the news where people realize that it is a bad idea to gather in large groups and not be vaccinated, that just saves some lives. So I'll take that if that makes uh, for a safer Hawaii. All I can say is everyone has to look into their own heart and decide what's best for their neighbors and for their families. As we wrap up here, I wanted to just look forward. We know that we continue to wait for approval on some of the things like the booster shot. We know today Pfizer also uh, will be seeking its approval for the vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. Uh, as we look ahead at potential booster shots, as more vaccine for children becoming available, uh, is the state prepared uh, as we begin this new phase of rollouts for vaccines and booster shots? It is uh, 119,000 keiki between age five and 11. Like I said, Sam is one. My 14 year old already has been vaccinated uh, twice with the Pfizer. We're ready. It'll be at schools. It'll be at clinics. It will be at pharmacies. Uh, we will encourage all of those 119,000 children to get the Pfizer vaccine or whatever else is available. What they did is they have it at a 30% uh, a dosage strength and it showed in trials to be both safe and also to be as effective for adults and adolescents. So. I'm very excited because that means a lot less spread to kids, means teachers will be safer, people who work at schools will be safer, society will be safer. It's a good thing. Again, people will have to ask their families whether they wanna do that for their kid and their pediatricians. We have a great pediatrician, uh, Dr. Tensala. Nadine is someone we go to all the time because I'm an adult doctor for the most part and we still ask for her advice. Uh, so ask your pediatrician now whether they recommend it for your kid if you've got a child five to 11. Be prepared because in just a few short weeks, I think that will be another option for Hawaii to be safer. We can continue to be the safest state in the country if we're smart. Okay, well, let's be smart. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, for joining us this morning. It's always great to have you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Aloha, thanks. Aloha. Well, great to hear from him there. And you saw a little bit of divergence uh, with him and the governor on a couple of key issues, travel being one of them. He said that the governor needs to make a statement in the next week or two to uh, reignite, if you will, the tourism economy, because we did see a big drop in uh, travel and cancellations. And he's saying now that the numbers are going down, we should try to encourage people to come to Hawaii for the holiday season, because it is such an important of our important part of our economic engine. And then on the issue of sports, we know that there's some mixed feelings on whether that's a big issue or not. But for some families, as we noted, it is very important. And uh, he's breaking with the governor there as well, saying that the fans, at least a limited number who are fully vaccinated, should be allowed back in the stands.
And we'll be interesting to see how and if the governor responds. The statement that the governor just made on this program a week ago uh, clearly said that he doesn't believe that it is safe that uh, a group gathering with that many people would be against what current restrictions uh, are, are in place. And it's counter to what they believe is a safe method moving forward. And that it just was simply not the time to allow any sort of crowds to gather in any, any capacity, be it at a UH sporting event or otherwise. And so the Lieutenant Governor obviously uh, making his opinion known on this subject, saying that at least family members, as you noted, should be allowed to uh, enter the stadium. We'll see if there's a response from the governor. Oftentimes there uh, is a lot of contrast in their beliefs and their styles and what they decide is the best steps forward. But ultimately the governor is the one that has that authority and we'll have to wait and see what he says. Uh, but also the Lieutenant Governor noting that cases continue to drop uh, and we're also seeing that reflected in the hospitals. He's saying that we should also see a, a lower number in the next few days with uh, the those patients in the hospital over the weekend set to be released as well on, on Monday and Tuesday. So we will likely see a drop in those numbers as well. Yeah, a lot of encouraging news there. We're going to dive deeper into the healthcare situation in our state on Wednesday with Dr. Libby Char. She, of course, sets a lot of the policy uh, just by virtue of her advice. She's not, you know, she says she's she's not political, but a lot of what she says is then adopted by the counties and by the state. Uh, and one of the things that she, of course, influences as well is Mike Victorino, the mayor of Maui. We're going to have him here on Friday. Uh, we're going to ask him about his Safer Outside program, which kind of mirrors the Safe Access Oahu program. Those are the two counties right now in the state that have adopted these vaccine verification programs. We'll ask him about how that's going in Maui. We've seen a lot of protests uh, on the Valley Isle, so we'll have to see uh, how that goes. That's right. Looking forward to the conversations this week. We want to thank you for being a part of the conversation today and the Lieutenant Governor for taking time to start his week off with us. We'll see you right back here on Wednesday for another episode of Spotlight Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii was brought to you by Chaminade University.